do you remember the sex talk? <laughs> Some of us probably are like, oh, we remember like the most awkward conversation with our parents ever. Uh, like they seemed awkward. We were awkward. Both of us clearly just wanted that conversation to be over. Um, some of us remember maybe like your parents gave you a book and you should read this. If you were a boy, you look through it, you're like, no pictures. I'm not reading this. <laughs> Others would say, oh, like I never had any kind of sex talk with my parents. Certainly people from certain cultures would say, no, like that just never even got talked about. Um, this idea of like that it was sort of shrouded in like shame, that it was taboo, that it was just something like don't talk about um, or maybe just like, hey, don't do it or you know, don't do it till you're ready, whatever that meant. Or when I was your age, you're like, nope, don't want to picture that. Oh, your father and I, nope, don't want to picture that either. Oh my gosh. It was probably a traumatic experience for some people. One, one person told me, VJ, my mother called me up the night before I was getting married saying, I need to tell you something. And she's like, what? You were having this conversation now? I'm 26. Um, so you can just take a deep breath. We are not having the sex talk, but... <laughs> We are having a sex talk in part because the writers of the Bible and actually God himself are, are not shy or ashamed or um, embarrassed or whatever in talking about sex. In fact, if you read the opening pages of scripture, literally in the first chapter, we find a naked man and a naked woman <laughs> looking at each other in a garden in the middle of the day saying, hey, this is good, <laughs> right? Like if you read the Bible growing up as a kid, like all of that was like covered with strategically placed, um, <laughs> you know, leaves or something. But like the, the Bible is not shy or ashamed or somehow thinks sex is weird or something to be avoided. It's actually in the opening pages of scripture. And so <clears throat> it should be a normal thing, <clears throat> excuse me, as a church community, as a faith community to talk about this. But the other reason we're talking about it today is because we need to, uh, simply because we are in a conversation that we started a couple of weeks ago called, I would never do that. <laughs> I would never do that and other lies we tell ourselves. In other words, that there are things and decisions and stuff that we could see other people make that we might label as stupid and foolish and immoral and illegal or whatever. We think, what an idiot, what a fool, or I would never do that. But actually realizing, no, we're all vulnerable and susceptible to making decisions we thought we'd never make. And specifically, if I can say in the world and the culture we live in, in every arena, if you look in every arena of life, of church, of politics, of education, of business, in families, in neighborhoods, <clears throat> in schools, we are seeing people make decisions about their sexual lives and relationships that in many ways are causing harm to themselves or others or to marriages or to workplaces that are resulting in breakdown, in chaos, in people losing jobs, in, um, in some cases, people even going to jail. <clears throat> and it's no good for us, even in that area, to just look at somebody else's choices or look at and think, I would never do that. I'm fine. <laughs> we said, hey, like, I would never do that is not a plan. <laughs> Uh, we actually need a better plan. We need to realize, wait a second, like we're, we're sort of capable of anything. And we said, hey, like actually a lot of these, um, some of the hurt and the chaos and the disruption and the difficulty and the pain could be avoided <clears throat> if we were willing to move from, I would never do that to actually I could fully do that. Right. I'm capable of things I never thought. No one thinks they would go for that epic fall. If you ask anyone, um, they don't plan on blowing up their lives or their marriages or losing their jobs or crossing the line in relationships or whatever. Nobody plans to do that. So we need to move from, yeah, I would never do that to, I could fully do that to actually a couple of weeks ago. I said the, maybe the best posture is Jesus. I never want to do that, which is inviting God into the conversation, <clears throat> which is something we're doing every week as we gather as a faith community, but also recognizing because I never want to do that, I need a plan in place. So today we're kind of talking about what does that look like in our relationships, specifically in the area of our sexual lives and our romantic relationships, wherever you happen to be <clears throat> um, in, in your life stage or as a follower of Jesus or not, or whatever age and stage you're in, that we all want to have good, thriving, healthy, and truly loving relationships in our lives. And how do we do that? together. Um, <clears throat> we begin our conversation today 
I'm reading a portion from a letter uh, that was written to a church, a community of people living in Corinth. Now, Corinth, it's not called Corinth anymore. It's actually, I think, considered part of Greece today, but it was an isthmus, like this piece of land kind of jutting out off of the coast of Greece. And it was a port city, and so lots of the trade, obviously, that happened in those days happened by sea, by boats. And so it was a very <clears throat> cosmopolitan area filled with people from many different backgrounds and existing as part of the Greco-Roman culture and the Roman Empire, which meant it was a very hyper-sexualized um, community, like sex was everywhere. And so in one sense, though this letter we're going to read was written 2,000 years ago, um, there are you're going to hear things in it that resonate so much with what our present thinking and our present day and our present um, culture is like. Um, Paul is writing to this church uh, that finds itself in a culture like this, but also was finding that there were people within the church community making unwise um, and, and immoral choices in their relationships that were affecting each other. And they were trying to think, like, how do we deal with this? How do we how do we actually live better? <laughs> and it's no good to say I would never do that. And the Apostle Paul actually prescribes for us a little bit of a pathway and how to think differently about this. And so I want you to listen to it and then we're going to unpack it together. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do everything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say, food was made for the stomach, and the stomach for food. This is true, though some day God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Now, at first glance, as you listen to this passage, there might be things that are easy to misunderstand or uh, misread or miss altogether. Um, and let me just say, like, these are instructions to a community of people that had begun to follow Jesus. These are not a general instructions to everyone. And in fact, there are things, uh, to be honest, that Paul would describe that actually would be good for all of us to live by. But as Jesus followers, it's like, hey, this is the life we're actually called to live, to live somewhat differently than the culture around us. But I'd encourage you, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, even if you're exploring, to actually think, like, what would the, my life look like if I actually began to consider this path? And what's amazing to me is 2,000 years later, as I said to you, even though many other things have changed, Paul describes, and we actually can deduce from this letter, some of the rules of engagement that the culture and even some of the people in the church were thinking. And I want to walk you through what those rules of engagement were and see if they don't sound very similar to the way that many of us and certainly many of our people in our culture think. The first is this, that you can do what you want. <laughs> and this is really from verse 12. He's quoting something they were saying back to him or that he was hearing, maybe through a letter. I am allowed to do anything, verse 12, saying like that this is the culture we live in, that we live in a culture that says, yeah, anything that I want to do, I should be able to do. That we live, as we said last week, that freedom is the number one value, certainly in North American culture. But Paul's even saying, yeah, so that's your opinion on this. That's how you're approaching this whole conversation about sexual relationships and romantic relationships inside and outside of marriage that, hey, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> that's the first rule of engagement. The second one comes from verse 13, which is basically sex is just an appetite that you need to satisfy. 
Verse 13, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. He's not talking about food, but he's saying this was a, this was a quote, this was a thing that people quoted about their sexual life, saying, hey, just like food for the stomach and stomach for food. In other words, we're made for food. Our stomachs are made for food, and food was made for us. So we just eat when you're hungry, and if you're thirsty, you drink, and if you're horny, you have sex. That's just what this is. This is just an appetite. This is an animal appetite. We talked about that last week, how this view of like, hey, if you want to do it, if you desire it, that must be natural. That must be a good thing for you. And that was clearly what people in the Corinthian culture and even in the Corinthian church thought. Yeah, like this is just an appetite like anything else. There's nothing moral about this. Paul, what's the problem? Thirdly, the belief in that culture and even still today was sex is just a physical act. This is just a physical thing. And we can kind of actually do, this isn't clearly coming out in the text, but Greek culture and Greek philosophy believed that the body was disposable and dispensable. Hey, we're going to die someday. And Plato himself, if you read Plato's Republic, you know, the whole analogy of the cave and the shadows, he was trying to say, what's real? What's really substantial? The conclusion of the Greek philosophers was, well, the soul, the unseen world is what's real and substantial. Your body, your life is just temporary, and therefore it doesn't matter what you do with your body. Y you're going to die anyways. That's why Paul's arguing later, saying, no, no, as Christ followers, you remember, we're going to have a bodily resurrection. The body really matters. In Greek culture, it's like it doesn't matter. So sex is just a part. It's an, it's an appetite, and it's just a physical exchange. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> That was the belief of that culture. And then lastly, in, in, in uh, kind of the subtext of this whole thing is something we actually say in our culture too. Your body, your choice. It's your body. Just do whatever you want with it. <laughs> These were the rules of engagement then. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, Paul's articulating that in this text, and that's still what our culture believes. In fact, our media, the stuff we stream, the music we listen to, the people we hang out with, the articles in the newspaper and psychology today all uh, generally reinforce these same rules of engagement. And in fact, we live in a world that has commoditized sex. Sex is literally everywhere. We've actually named it an industry. We've actually named it as something that you can buy that sex is for sale, that a human being or sex with a human being is something you can buy or virtual sex or whatever the internet. It is, it is not only ubiquitous, it is commoditized and we have put a price on it. Um, this is sort of humorous and sort of tragic, um, but even this is in all of our media. Next week, we're going to talk about actually the media we watch and stream. But I found online someone who did a, a family tree diagram of Grey's Anatomy, a series of uh, supposedly a medical drama, but really it's just a drama that has streamed for many seasons. And they did like a family tree describing all of the relationships that were happening. You can see in the little uh, legend there as they described like not only who's parents and kids, but who was married, what were hookups, right? Which is now like a new category of sexual relationship. Casual sex is just, oh, it's not, it's not it's just a physical exchange. It's a hookup. It's not a long-term relationship. It's not a marriage. It's not a dating thing. It's just a sexual encounter with a mutually, uh, with another person who mutually agrees and consents to do this. And what's crazy is if you look in this family tree, I won't show you the whole thing because it's not that interesting, but there's about 24 different sets of generations or relationships. And if you exclude um, like incestual relationships that, which aren't aren't in the show there are 24 different hookups between people in this one show in addition to affairs and so the hookup culture casual sex is just a regular part of the drama and i use this as an example simply to say this is everywhere this is normalized and not just quote in the culture even as we sit here today listening even as we dive into a conversation about this even as we read a passage about sex we need to understand our default understanding is the rules of engagement and in some ways the same ones that were there in this text 2000 years ago that i'm free to do whatever i want no one can tell me what i can do that um uh, it's it's my decision to make that sex is just an appetite like any other appetite. It's just a physical act, <laughs> and my body is my own. The problem is the rules of engagement aren't working. 
if we're really honest with ourselves and we take an honest look, not just at our lives, but at our friends' lives and our family lives and the culture around us and the news around us, the rules of engagement are not working. In fact, if you take the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s, which really sought to normalize and formalize these rules of engagement, saying, hey, anyone is free sexually to do whatever they want, the introduction of the birth control pill, and all of that that came from it. Actually, what we see in a culture like ours in North America that espouses freedom as its number one value and the freedom of the sexual revolution, what we have is actually more sex addiction. Even though we're free to, whatever, to do whatever we want, we have actually become slaves to sex. Sexual addiction is at an all-time high, of, certainly, of course, with digital pornography being one of the main catalysts of that. But we also have more sexual exploitation and trafficking than ever before. Do you know there are more slaves in the world? They estimate 27 million people are enslaved around the world, most of whom are women and children, most of whom are in the sex industry. That is more people enslaved than in the North Atlantic slave trade of the 17th and 18th centuries and the, the slave trade in Great Britain and in the southern United States combined. We have more slavery than ever, and sexual slavery is a huge part of that. So sexual exploitation and trafficking is at an all-time high, despite being very free to do whatever we want. <laughs> we have more sexual violence in our news and in our relationships and even in our media. <laughs> and the general social survey, which is in the United States, or stats can report that we are having more affairs. Married couples are having more affairs than ever, and the connecting with exes on um, social media, whatever, making that more prevalent. And they say that the, 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 if uh, a couple has an affair, they're more likely to end up having a divorce. So the increase of affairs is ultimately probably long-term going to lead to increased rates of divorce. Friends, this is not working for us. Mary Eberstadt, who's a, um, a fictional, non-fictional writer and published books and published in the New York Times and Time Magazine and many different publications in her book, Adam and Eve After the Pill, says this, Contrary to conventional depiction, the sexual revolution has proved a disaster for many men and women. And listen, its weight has fallen heaviest on the smallest and weakest shoulders in society, even as it has given extra strength to those already strongest and most predatory. Friends, this speaks directly to the commodification, the industry of sex, the exploitation and trafficking as well. Our sexual revolution and the rules of engagement are not working. And so we actually, even though there are things, even in this passage I'm about to say that we might go, oh, we have resistance to, we need to allow the biblical view of sexuality to reshape our thinking. And it is not a view that is prudish, like I said, that is taboo, that is shame-filled. <laughs> Um, and in fact, even as we have a conversation like this, my desire is not to heap any shame or guilt on anyone, not to, um, and, and recognizing that everybody's story is different and unique, um, and that uh, each of us thinks about this is in a different stage of life and a different story, and, and yet we all have to recognize like this is a part of something. We, we actually need to rethink this in some way, and the biblical writers give us a new way to think about this. And I want to uh, use this passage to describe Paul's <laughs> reiteration of different rules of engagement when it comes to our sexual and romantic relationships. First of all, he says this, your freedom can actually enslave you, right? In verse 12, he says, even though you say, quote, I'm allowed to do anything, he says, I must not become a slave to anything. In other words, and we talked about this last week, Part of you being a free person is freely choosing to limit your freedoms in some ways. In fact, to find the right limitations so that you can actually be free. Because <laughs> he says your freedom, if you just say, I can do anything I want, you will actually become enslaved to it, which is actually what sex addiction is telling us. The more free we have been, the more enslaved we are. And Paul says, so be careful. Freedom isn't just doing whatever you want. Secondly, he says sex isn't just a physical act to satisfy an appetite. He says it's two people becoming one. And this idea of oneness in sexuality is the Bible's view. And this is actually a really high view of sex. It's a, it's a lofty, incredibly beautiful view of sex that this is not just a physical thing, but physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, mysteriously, when two people have sex, they become one. 
And he is actually quoting this to become one from something, a passage that was written thousands of years before him in Genesis, in the opening chapters of the Bible. And here's what that tells me. The scriptures were way ahead of its time when it came to understanding sex, right? Modern psychology and modern medicine is catching up to this fact that sexuality is not just a physical exchange. In fact, there's so much of emotions and psyche involved in sex. They say that if a, a, a dating couple is uh, sexually active, it's harder to actually break up if they want to say, oh, this isn't a good relationship. If they're sexually involved, it's harder to do that. Why? Because they're bonded to this person. It's not just a physical exchange that two people agree upon. We actually even know this empirically, that sex means so much more to us and is so much more than just a physical exchange. Even the simple uh, consideration of the fact that you know, let's say you, you broke your arm when you were six. If you're 46, chances are you've healed completely from that a long time ago. But if you had any kind of sexual harm when you were six, that may take years and decades to heal from. Why? Because it's not just a physical harm. Intuitively, we actually know this. There's so much more wrapped up in sex than just the physical exchange. In fact, we know this sex therapist will tell you the most, the most powerful sex organ you have is your mind, not your body parts. And in fact, if I can say that, it's almost even taken on spiritual or godlike proportions in our society, which is ironic because on one level, our, our culture's view, and perhaps some of us in the room have this view of like, oh, sex is nothing. It's just, it's no big deal. Like people do it. It's not a big deal. And yet it is mass, it has taken on massive proportions. It is really the new experience of transcendence in our culture. I mean, uh, you don't have millions and millions and millions of songs being written about food and cars <laughs> or drinking water. Like, it's not like any other appetite. What? It's about sex because it's so much more than just a physical appetite. And the shows we binge watch, whatever, tend to be most often about the melodramas, about romantic and sexual relationships. Why? Because it, it draws our emotions and our psyches and it's not just a physical thing. <laughs> and Paul points that out. It's actually two becoming one, it's this powerful, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, mysterious thing. And then in verse 19, he says, probably the most countercultural thing that anyone could say to us living in the 21st century, you do not belong to yourself. Right? He says, you belong to God. And again, for this is for people who consider themselves followers of Jesus, right? The earliest declaration of good news of Jesus followers was Jesus is Lord. In other words, he's the Lord of my life. And we were at a seminar uh, a little while ago with our staff team, and one, the speaker said this. He says, faith, for, in Christian spirituality, faith isn't just trusting in some beliefs about God. Listen to this. It is that you are trusting yourself to God, including your body. You are trusting him with your body. You are entrusting your life to him because you belong to him. And the Apostle Paul says, hey, your body is not your own. You have to be careful with it. Not only is this not just sort of some casual physical exchange, not only is this something you can actually get addicted to, your bodies are not your own. You belong to God. And you are, in a sense, you belong to each other. We are interconnected, right? Our spirituality with God is also has horizontal dimensions that we are connected to each other, right? There's, we have this saying in our culture, it's like, do whatever you want to do as long as you don't harm anyone. The problem is do whatever you want to do is a very selfish way to engage the world. And here's the thing, and every one of us knows this as soon as I say it. If you live your life selfishly, you will inevitably harm other people right? A very selfish person is doing harm to other people because it is impossible to just do whatever you want without harming another because everyone is affected by the choices we make. And that's true about the relationships we have. Like, right, if I, I had a friend who's a consultant and he said he's working with a company and he said, man, the culture of this company was very distrusting, a lot of backbiting, a lot of hiddenness, a lot of secrets. And he said, and then I find out that the CEO and the CFO are sleeping together. They're both married to other people and everybody knows they're having an affair. And he's like, no kidding. He's not even a person of faith. He's like, no kidding. The rest of the culture of this company is like this. The decisions we make impact other people. We are interconnected to one another. And then he says this, maybe one of the most progressive views of sex. He says in verse 18, he said, in a, in a sense, anyone who sins sexually sins against themselves. In other words, you can actually harm yourself by the decisions you make. <laughs> 
right? We would expect him to say, you know, the Bible is so angry about sex, right? Oh, anyone who sins sexually is from the devil or something. He's like, no, you can actually sin against yourself, which means it's like, what? I didn't even know I could sin against myself. That's where we get out of this oversimplified view of sin as just doing bad things and saying, wait a second, it's possible to harm myself? Or if I think about sin as being this thing that takes me away from the person I am meant to be, my true self, which is ironic because we say, hey, one of the ways to have your tr- to be your true self is to do whatever you want sexually, to express yourself sexually, do whatever that we want. Paul says, actually, you could do that and actually not become the person you were meant to be. That's what it means to fall short or to sin against yourself is that you don't end up becoming who you were meant to be. Friends, these are very different and very countercultural rules of engagement, but they offer us an antidote to, quite frankly, the rules that existed in Corinth 2,000 years ago and still today that just aren't working. (laughs) So what do we do if we begin to consider these things as true, that possibly to exercise our freedom is actually choose in certain ways and times to limit it because we could actually become enslaved in our sexual choices? to realize that we are not just animals who have to satisfy our desires, to realize that sex isn't just a physical thing that we exchange, that our bodies actually are not our own. If we follow Jesus, our lives belong to him, and that it's possible actually to do harm to ourselves if we don't make wise choices. So what does that mean? Whether you're single or dating or engaged, whatever stage of life you happen to be, whether you're married, We have to recognize this is the air we breathe and we are products of the culture we live in. And so it's hard for us to think differently. And we're surrounded by these other rules of engagement that quite frankly aren't working. So if we are going to live and move in a different way, that's not going to happen by accident. (laughs) And one of the things I proposed to you in this series last week, we introduced this idea of guardrails. What does it mean? to, um, and this we were borrowing this language from author and pastor Andy Stanley. What does it mean if we want to have good, loving, and healthy relationships to put a, and he uses the analogy of a guardrail, is it's something that's in the safe zone. It's not like, it's not something we have to do, <clears throat> but it's something we choose to do or not do in order to, um, and it's not illegal or immoral or unethical or whatever, but we choose to do it anyways. It's a limit to help us stay well away from a fall that we never want to (laughs) take and something that could destroy our relationships with our loved ones. (laughs) And actually, Paul describes, he doesn't use the word guardrails, but in verse 18, he says, in light of all this, what does he say? Flee from sexual sin. In other words, run away, Monty Python, right? Run away. Don't walk on the edge of the line. Andy Stanley, as I mentioned this last week, he says, you know, we live in a culture that not only does not have guardrails, it just has painted lines at the edge of the road saying, drink responsibly, don't have sex too already. But also our culture baits us to the edge or baits us to walk as close to the edge as we can and then vilifies us and criticizes us if we fall. Instead, we want to run away, we want to stay well away from the edge so that we can not be panicked and paranoid that we might fall over, so that we can actually live with freedom because we have put the right limits in place in our lives. So here's some suggestions for you for guardrails. And and this is, again, this is for Jesus followers. If you're not a Jesus follower, you may be like, great, I don't have to follow this. And you're right, you don't. But can I ask you to consider, hey, maybe these are things that actually work because they're true. Maybe Jesus is inviting you to rethink your sexual relationship, to rethink what you think about all of this. And if you are a Jesus follower, friends, this is what we're invited into following. It doesn't, some of it um, doesn't sit well with us. Some of it goes against the culture we're in. In fact, I'm going to suggest some guardrails to you, and they're not rules, okay? These are just suggestions of potential guardrails you could use. If you don't like them, that's fine. Come up with different ones, but don't dis mine if you have none of your own, right? Consider these as suggestions, and some of these are mine. Some of these are ones I've learned from other people, um, but you may say, okay, whatever it is, I have to figure out. These aren't laws of scripture. These are wise practices to help us walk aw- um, or stay well away from the edge to actually live in freedom. So here's my suggestion. <clears throat> For everyone, um, if you're still under 21, my suggestion, consider moving your drinking age to 21. This was actually something my father suggested to me when I went away to university, and it was a really good guardrail for me. Like zero 
zero drinks, because <laughs> I was under 21 when I was in school, was an easy number for me to remember <laughs> when I was out at the bar with my friends. Zero is an easy number. And me, this worked for me because I like a hard boundary. I don't like boundaries in general, so the clearer they are is just better for me. I maybe have a little bit of an addictive personality or whatever, and I'm really social, and I know I can kind of just go with wherever the crowd's going. So for me, I'm super social. I knew I was going to want to go out with my friends. This line was really helpful for me. Um, I actually suggested it to my boys, but I said, hey, it's up to you guys, whatever you think. But I just know a lot of my friends in university, some of them by fourth year started drinking with me as in zero because they're like, yeah, I don't want the regrets. You know, I don't want to not know what I did last night. Alcohol is a gateway to some other things. Oftentimes that end up in places we never planned. And so that could be a good guardrail for you. Have a visible calendar. My Google calendar is visible to my staff and my wife. They can see, I make sure I put everything I'm doing in the calendar and my wife can see it anytime. There shouldn't be whole chunks of your life where people don't know where you are or time that is unaccounted for where no one is aware of what you are doing or whether in a work context or at home or whatever. That is just a really good practice. If you're traveling for work, do not travel alone with someone of the opposite sex. This is awkward to try to manage sometimes, but this is something when I was traveling for business, I made sure to try to do as often as I could. Sometimes it was just impossible, but for the most part, that was my plan. Separate cars, separate flights, whatever, arriving at different times, that was just something, and I didn't have to make a big deal of it with my team. I just knew that's what I was planning when I was working that way. That is just helpful practice. You might say, oh, is there anything wrong with that? No. That's the point. It's well away from the line. But Andy Stanley's point about Gardo's, one of the things he says is like, hey, when you watch a movie about two people who end up having an affair, where does the movie start? With them in bed having an affair? He's like, no. It starts with them on a business trip. It starts with them in a restaurant. It starts with a place that isn't wrong, illegal, immoral, unethical, anything. That's the point. He said, that's where all these things start. So have a guardrail in the place where you can keep it. That way, if you can't possibly keep it for a day or something happens, you haven't done anything wrong. You're still in the safe zone. This is a general rule. Do not engage with exes on social media. <laughs> like unless you're still dating and it was a good relationship and now you're trying to get back together, fine. But generally speaking, especially if you had a sexual relationship with them, because the draw, that bond is far more than just a physical thing. And so my rule would be just don't do it. Don't do it. Now, if you are hoped to be dating, you are dating, if you're engaged or perhaps you're divorced and dating again or considering dating again, my suggestion to you in your relationship would be to have a define the boundaries conversation, not a define the relationship, define the boundaries, right? Draw lines between what is affectionate contact and what is sexual contact. Because for a follower of Jesus, unless you're married, sexual, that's what sexual immorality means, is sex outside and sexual contact outside of marriage. So sexual contact is off limits if you're a follower of Jesus and you're dating. Doesn't matter if you're divorced and dating again or engaged or whatever. Affectionate contact, yes. Sexual contact, no. So draw the lines between what those are. And then I would say this proactively. Focus on growing your spiritual, emotional, and mental connection with the other person. So some people who have had long distance relationships, it's not a bad thing. Why? You have to learn how to talk. You have to learn how to relate. The physical exchange, the physical intimacy is sort of easy. To, it's an easy go-to. And the more you express that in a dating relationship, the more the other things, in my experience, can get stunted. That you don't learn to cultivate your emotional and mental and spiritual connection because it's just easy to try to connect physically and each of you feel somehow fulfilled in that. But you're missing the other components in your life. So invest in those. And I would say to that end, plan your dates ahead of time. If you don't plan your dates ahead of time, you will end up probably every night watching a movie in a dark room under a blanket or whatever. And if you're trying to stay away from sexual content, I'm just telling you that's where the movie's heading, okay? So you have to plan if that's where you're trying to live. Listen, I know some of this is like, some people are like, what's wrong with that? That's the point. There's nothing. You're trying to stay away from the edge. And if you don't like my boundaries, figure out your own, but don't not have any, okay? Lastly, if you're married, these are a bunch of them I've already mentioned. Certainly for everyone, applies to everyone who's married. Um, but one of my friends who's a, a, a Christian leader in an organization, he said, I don't drink in a mixed crowd if my wife's not with me, right? If my wife's with me, I want to have a drink or two. But if she's not there, I'm in a mixed crowd. He said, I just don't do that. Is there anything wrong with him having a drink in a mixed crowd? No, but he's keeping himself well away from the line. That's a really concrete, right, easy to understand um, not like, oh, I'm not sure. Is my wife here? No, that's really easy to understand. And zero, as I said, is an easy number to remember. That's a, that's a good boundary. 
Another one is this is this is more about a boundary type conversation or guardrail type conversation. Ask your spouse, is there any one of the opposite sex in my life that you feel uncomfortable about? Like about my interactions with them or their interactions with me? Now, this may lead to a volatile conversation. These are important. These should be in play, not for paranoia, but sometimes your spouse senses something or sees something that you don't see. And it's not a matter of, oh, you know, Jen and I've had these conversations. It's not a matter of, oh, you don't trust me. It's not about trust. This is just about recognizing our humanity and recognizing the goal we both want to achieve. And so we're helping each other with that. And let me just say this, whatever your boundaries are, <laughs> can I say this, you know, whether you're single or dating or married or whatever it is, whatever your boundaries are, whatever the guardrails are, when you trip a wire on one of them, tell somebody. Tell somebody. Certainly if you're married and you trip one of those boundaries, again, you haven't done anything damaging at that point, but you just know and you tell your spouse or you tell the person you're dating or you tell a friend, hey, I tripped a boundary. And we're going to talk about what those are in our media um, and our digital habits next week. But this is about our interpersonal relationships. Look, at even as I've talked through this, Aside from, you know, some of the objections and questions you have, like I, I realize some of this may have brought up some things for you. Per perhaps some of you, it, there's some resistance you feel. Like, uh, like, I don't like that or whatever. And, and then that's okay, right? But maybe ask yourself, why am I resisting that? Or why did that bother me so much? Perhaps for some of you, this is like surfaced like shame or guilt or regret. And can I just say, in Jesus, we don't have to live with any shame or guilt or regret. That's not the way God works in our lives. The enemy of our soul, the devil, works to shame us and pour guilt on us and paralyze us in a vague sense of you're terrible, you're dirty, you shouldn't have done that, you're a failure, whatever. Those are all from the pit of hell, not from God. God works in our lives in a different way. He just, he just uh, like gently but very clearly puts his finger of conviction on something specific. And so if something specific has come up that you need to deal with, or you need to change, you need to confess, you can do that. <laughs> or if you just feel shame or regret or whatever, like, wish I knew this 10 years ago, you can ask for God to heal that part of your life, to free you. That's part of what our renewal prayer ministry is for. But any of our pastors or trusted friend in your church can pray for you for that. Perhaps fear has come up in your life or maybe questions or just like complexity. I don't know where to go with this. Can I just, as you, as you try to work this out and talk these through, can I just pray for you and bring all of those things that maybe have come up for us <clears throat> in this to Jesus? Jesus, you, you lived in our shoes. You know what it is like to be human, to be a sexual being. <laughs> you know what it was like to be single. And in fact, in some cases for that status in life, in your culture to be looked at, like people must have wondered, was there something wrong with you? Why didn't you have a partner? <laughs> and so you, <clears throat> you lived through many of the situations we've been in. <clears throat> and you lived in a world and in a culture that was surrounded by so many different ideas about sex and romance and relationships. And so we thank you that we follow a God who has walked and worked and lived in our shoes, that you understand us, that you have been tempted in every way as we have, that you know the frailty of these human bodies. Thank you that you did not stay far off from us, but you entered our world. And so, Lord, we ask for your healing, for your wisdom, for your direction, for your love, for your conviction, for your health and strength to lead us into what it looks like to have healthy, good, and truly loving relationships in our lives with the people in our family, in our workplace, in our schools, in our church, and in our neighborhoods. Continue to lead us in this, Jesus, we pray. Amen.